Uh, thanks everybody for for joining. Um, excited to have you all here. Uh, you know, we do this Moonlight in the Garden um, event every year. Well, not for the last two years, but um, otherwise we do. And it, it always gets me um, reinvigorated in my own garden about uh, enjoying it in the evenings. I, uh, I come home from work and every day the, I let the dogs out and we walk around the garden and enjoy it, see what needs to be done, you know, depending on how much energy I have, I, I actually get some of those things done. And then we hit um, in the daylight savings and it's dark when I get home and I don't, uh, I can't do a whole lot in the garden at that point because it's dark when I get home from work, but I can still enjoy it. Uh, and And every year when we do this moonlight in the garden, I uh, it, it inspires me to add a little more lighting to my garden, to think about how I'm planting uh, to to really make the garden more enjoyable in the evening. Because let's face it, for many of us, that's um, other than the weekends, that's when we get to spend the most time in the garden is is in the evenings and here in the southeast. Uh, often the evenings are a lot more pleasant than the um, middle of the day. So so uh, I think we we sometimes forget about that. We think about seasons in the garden, but we don't always think about when is it that we do enjoy the garden or we'd like to enjoy the garden more. It may be that uh, the, your garden is not very night friendly, I guess I'll say. Um, and, uh, you know, this maybe we'll get some some thoughts on on how to make some changes there. Uh, I love sitting out in the evening as it's getting darker in, in spring, summer, and fall. Um, well, even winter, I actually like sitting outside in the cold in, in winter and uh, appreciating appreciating the garden. I'm going to talk about this this night garden, and and that can mean a lot of things uh, to a lot of uh, people. It doesn't it doesn't always mean the same thing. Uh, to everybody. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this, but I once had a, a, well, I still have a friend who's a designer, but he talked about designing a garden for somebody who liked uh, to throw parties. And that person lived up on a, uh, well, the house was kind of raised where their main living area was, and there was a deck there, and you look down kind of over the garden, and he was going to put in all kinds of uh, black lights in the garden, this designer, uh, to, to bring out some of the, the colors in, in the garden. And I haven't gone that far, but there is a lot you can do with um, in the evenings. Something that I think gets overlooked a lot is uh, not just fragrance, but when flowers are fragrant. There are quite a few um, plants that if you go out and um, walk by them early in the day, they just don't have much going on. But by the end of the day and, you know, the heat build up these uh, volatile oils that provide some of the, the scents, um, they really start kicking in. And uh, some plants are really notorious for that. Some of the tobaccos like uh, Nicotiana sylvestris, which um, you can see here, uh, this tall uh, white flowering plant, which which I think is a beautiful um, annual plant. It does not does not uh, survive the winters terribly well. Uh, but, you know, you get the big um, uh, bold texture of the foliage and then these spikes of, of flowers above there. And um, you don't get a whole lot of things eating on your, your flowering tobaccos either. Uh, this in front is another uh, type of flowering tobacco that's more commonly grown as an annual, Nicotiana alata. And they're usually available in whites and 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 pinks here, as you can see, this is in our annual trial, so they're just lined up. But uh, I used to never be impressed with them, but the the more um, recent uh, breeding has really gotten them very floriferous. And, and I have intentionally gone by these in the, uh, in the evening, in the late afternoon, e going into evening, 
to see if they are fragrant. And I don't have a great sense of smell. Those of you who know me know that, but they actually um, do have a fragrance. I don't, I don't actually grow either one of those at my home, but something that I always grow is, is actually a relative of um, flowering tobaccos is uh, Brugmansia or angel's trumpet. And angel's trumpet, uh, I always love when I'm if, when I'm here at the Arboretum and we have one in bloom when we have an evening uh, event because people will walk by it during the day and say, oh, it's beautiful, it's beautiful, it's beautiful. And then they come through in the evening and uh, the fragrance um, just about blows you over. Um, this particular one I really like. So Brugmansias are relatively hardy here in Raleigh and, and parts south. Uh, when they're young, they can, they can tolerate, they can benefit from some extra mulching in the winter. They'll die back to the ground. Uh, and then they'll come back and have these, you know, nice woody stems uh, with large leaves and these, these hanging flowers that can be, you know, nearly a foot long. They need to get to a certain height before they start flowering. And they're very heavy feeders, so water them and fertilize them to really push them to get, get some height. Inca Sun is a nice one because uh, it'll start flowering much earlier in the season. Uh, some of the other ones, really, it takes them a while to get going. Now, they'll, they'll keep flowering until uh, the weather gets cool once they start going. Um, but uh, Inca Sun always starts a little bit earlier. It's got this kind of creamy coral orange uh, uh, color to it. Uh, there are white ones and pink ones and, and deeper orange ones. When you start getting into the, the more exotic colors, they tend to be uh, less hardy, less cold hardy, although you can bring them inside. Should warn people, I guess, that they are very, very poisonous, so don't eat them, uh, you know. People don't get poisoned by plants accidentally very often. They, When they get poisoned by plants, they're usually ingesting them on purpose. Uh, so, but be warned. Um, this is another Brugmansia, kind of same colored flower, uh, but with this uh, silvery white edge to the leaf. And this is a really a double whammy for the night garden in that you get that fragrance. And I love being out in a kind of a dark garden and just having these fragrances waft uh, on the breeze and you're not sure exactly where they're coming from. Um, but this whole planting, you know, I'll talk a little bit more, I'll talk more about this, but you know, white flowers really reflect the moonlight uh, and whatever, uh, you know, light from houses or street lights are, are out there. Um, and then with this one, you get this, uh, this white edge to the leaf and it really does, um, with just some ambient light out in a dark garden, uh, this um, peaches and cream really kind of shimmers out there. Uh, doesn't doesn't give you a really fully defined plant, but it, it shimmers, and I, I love that. I think the night garden is kind of a uh, it can be kind of a mysterious, uh, romantic type of place, um, and so that because of that that mystery of, of, you know, what's there, what isn't there is, is I, I think can be really neat. Uh, you know, other, other fragrant plants, um, the, the tuberose, you may know, the, the tuberose, they, some people are now putting them in as agaves, but, uh, they'll always be polyanthes in my heart. Um, another ones that really, you know, these are known for their fragrance. Uh, tuberoses are, are really known for their fragrance, but uh, it isn't until late afternoon and evening that they really get uh, uh, super fragrant. This is a, an old standby with double flowers, but still very fragrant called the Pearl. Um, they they kind of started drifting into getting some colors in there with yellow baby and some some similar ones and now there's some really intensely uh colored ones with oranges and, and reds and golds i don't have as much experience growing those so um i don't know if they're trickier or not but generally a sunny well-drained spot uh, does great for these and that that um 
uh, very uh, uh, sweet fragrance uh, floats around from, from that. Some of the, the hybrids with some different species where you get these longer flowers like sunset and chirp. Uh, honestly, I'm sure that there are plenty of people who could tell them apart out in the garden. You know, chirp has some more speckles in there and this tends to be more yellow, but the truth is and you could put one in front of me and tell me it was the other and I wouldn't fight you about it, but they're both great. Um. Another plant that I often talk about when I talk about, um, you know, uh, uh, plants that have multiple uses are the four clocks, Mirabilis Jalapa Baywatch. Uh, Jalapa uh, gives you a clue that it's um, Mexico from Jalapa uh, region of Mexico. Um, sometimes these are called, uh, I forget, like, other than four clocks, they have a couple other names and I can't remember. Baywatch is a big one with, with white flowers. Um, there are other ones like Flaming Fuchsia that's a smaller growing one, but with these really intensely uh, colored flowers. And again, uh, they're called four o'clocks because they don't start getting fragrant until about four o'clock and into the evening. Um, I know people who've called them four o'clocks all their lives and never thought about why they, they're called that. Um, I talk about these uh, quite a bit because not just for the, the great fragrance of the flowers, uh, but because um, Japanese beetles like to eat them and, and they're toxic to Japanese beetles. So I always tell people, plant these around your roses and around your hibiscus and other things that Japanese beetles uh, like to munch on and uh, you'll you'll have fewer problems. I won't say no problems, but fewer problems. Uh, these will kind of seed a bit politely around the garden, not a whole lot. Uh, I learned it as an annual, but around here, they really can perennialize and you can get some great big tubers on there. Uh, so just pull them out anywhere you don't want them, but uh, they, you can usually get a little seed pack for, you know, couple of bucks and uh, sprinkle them around in the spring and have them pop up and, and they'll, they'll hang around for quite a while. There are other species and this one's less widely grown, but it's one that I love. It's one that I grow um, in the garden. It's Mirabilis longiflora. And you can see it's called longiflora because this is the floral tubes on, on here. And the floral tubes are six inches or more. You can kind of see here how these, um, they sit up and I'll go out in the morning and it'll kind of look all sad and droopy and whatever. And it just gets better and better as it sits in the sun all day. And when I come home, they're all standing up. They're all fragrant, fragrant as can be. Uh, and, um, the, you know, even as it gets darker, that, that, uh, that light colored flower, um, reflects the the light and shows up they will seed a little bit around uh but not much and because they're a little bit airier than uh some of these other uh mirabilis and and um things they kind of will just kind of wind their way around other plants pretty politely and i'll just pull out a few wherever i don't want them but they do kind of give a, a every year they shift a little bit in my garden and um keep things mixed up and I like that. I like the other plants grow this growing around and other other plants and other plants growing through it and whatnot. But really uh, intensely fragrant. Um, one that was a new one for me a, a handful of years ago is this Mirabilis multiflora, uh, which again has that evening fragrance, but kind of a tidier habit than most whoop, most of the other ones. Um, this one does want really very well-drained soil. It's a little bit trickier. Um, so uh, probably more for the advanced gardener or somebody who's a little more adventurous, but um, still you get that great evening fragrance. And, and these fragrant nighttime flowers, you know, if you get them around where you'll be in the evening, um, you know, I like to plant them, the, the, this uh, Mirabilis I have planted near my driveway. So when I come in in the evenings, it's, it's there. Uh, 
I have some some chairs out sitting in front of my house that I like to sit on in the evening after it's too late for me to garden. And I have these fragrant evening plants uh, around that, uh, those chairs. Uh, I don't use my back deck much, so I don't put these, these plants back there so much. Um, so it's really about where I'm going to be, uh, uh, that, that I plant these cause you're not, there are a lot of areas of your garden you don't go to a lot at night. So, so don't waste these fragrant things on, on those, those areas. Lilies, I'm, I'm having a renaissance love affair with lilies. Uh, I kind of went through a phase where I got snobby and turned up my nose at some of these lilies, They're big and gaudy and I just love them, love them, love them again, uh, especially the species lilies. And when I can keep the rabbits from biting the tops off them, uh, you know, they are, they are just can be stars of the garden. Now, this is a big one, Lilium regale, uh, the royal lily um, has these kind of burgundy uh, buds that open up to white flowers consecutively. And um, these are, have, some fragrance during the day, you sometimes have to stick your nose in them, but by mid afternoon and into the evening, they are just almost overpowering. You don't want to, you wouldn't want to have your chair sit right here in the middle of them uh, when they're going. They're super easy to grow. They will um, seed some in the garden uh, very nicely, uh, I think. Um, and there are a lot of lilies that are very fragrant, but not all of them. So um, do look for that if you want um, fragrant lilies. Uh, it is not all of them that will be fragrant. So um, you know, keep an eye out for that. But most of the ones that are tend to be fragrant later in the evening. But that's, again, not always the case. Some are intensely fragrant all the time, it seems like. Uh, a daylily. Now, this is just a plain yellow daylily, but it's a species um, that uh, goes into some of the background of some of those really tall blooming um, uh, daylilies that are out there. And this is sometimes called the commuter daylily because its fragrance comes in the evening. It's easy to grow. It's kind of, uh, you know, it's doesn't have those thick, waxy, wavy, petaled flowers that you get from uh, some of the modern hybrids or, you know, weird colors or uh, whatever. But uh, in my mind, again, with not a great sense of spell, most of those modern hybrids don't have much of a fragrance at all. Uh, whereas this Lilio asphodelus, uh, uh, Hemerichaus Lilio asphodelus, the, the asphodelus, as photoline lily, um, day lily, uh, has really a beautiful uh, fragrance in the evening. Um, it is not a repeat bloomer. Uh, when it flowers, it, it flowers relatively heavily um, and will flower over an extended period, but it's not, it won't, it's not like your happy returns and Stella Dora that that will that will rebloom and rebloom. So you enjoy it when it flowers and then. You know, other things can take its place. Gingers. Uh, that's another, this is another one, the ginger lilies that I have. Um, uh, that I have really, really um, come to uh, love uh, again. Um, I, I don't, uh, I kind of uh, at one point, kind of said, uh, you know, they're gaudy. I, I went, th I must have gone through a terrible snobby phase in my gardening life, but I've circled rack back around to being um, gaudy and over the top. And uh, these are almost without exception, the, the um, ginger lilies, the hedicums, they're not fragrant until late in the day and the evening. And, and these are plants that we sometimes collect in the wild and will bring back and we're always excited when they first flower. And, um, you know, we 
usually I mean, my colleagues who have done this, who have these new plants, go out and see them in the morning. They're flowering, exciting. You say, is it fragrant? And they say, I don't smell anything now. And then we always get a text, you know, later in the evening. It says, oh, it's amazing. It's so fragrant at night. Um, and, uh, you know, you can get them in, you know, there's the whites, the old pass along um, butterfly, ginger lily, uh, oranges like this um, Tara, uh, yellow peaches, coral, um, nearly red. Uh, and they're, they're just beautiful, um, upright structural plants. So, uh, you know, uh, some of these, um, like the um, moonflower, Ipomoea alba, uh, known as moonflower, again, gives you a clue uh, about it. Um, I don't know if it's fragrant. I've never been able to get much of a fragrance from it. Somebody else may may say differently. Um, there are some smells that I just can't that don't register on my nose. Uh, but it's really known as moonflower, and it's an annual vine. It, it'll, it'll, it won't last through the winter um, because it opens up at night and it just reflects all the, the light from the moon. And those who people who hear me talk a lot know I love vines. Uh, I love growing them on arbors like this one is, but I also really love just growing them through other plants. And annual vines are good for that because they're there. They can really almost smother the plant and then they're dead. Uh, and so next year you can do something different. But you can take something, you know, an evergreen shrub or or something that would disappear at night in the, the dark. And if you grow a vine with white flowers up through it, all of a sudden you've got these spots of, of light that, that are reflecting in the, the um, in a plant that would otherwise not really uh, uh, show much. Um, same thing with roses. Uh, roses can be grown on other plants, believe it or not. They don't have to be grown on trellises and, and things, the climbing roses, and actually do very well growing in low branched, sturdy trees. This is an old one that's a, a wild type called uh, Cooper's Burma um, with these white flowers. And again, this will just glow in, in moonlight. Doesn't need any supplemental lighting or anything. As long as there's some ambient light out there from moon or from other, you know, from the, all the lights that we have in our landscapes, intentional and otherwise, um, these things will, will glow. And it doesn't have to be just flowers. Foliage is great for reflecting that light. This is, um, uh, first cousin of, of a cardoon or uh, artichoke, um, Cynara syriacus. It's, it's just about the same as, as, uh, the cardoons that you can grow. Beautiful plant. Uh, I really like it for this, these evening gardens because it, it kind of goes not quite dormant, but almost disappears for much of the summer, the hot part. And then as it gets cool and days get shorter, it uh, really flushes out and grows. So it's really lush right now and will continue to be lush. And so right as I really need something in the evenings to see, uh, it, it really is, is magical uh, in the garden like that. Same with, with some of these, especially these fuzzy leafed uh, silvery things. Uh, they really will capture uh, light very well. So this salvia argentia, there, there are other, you know, the old lamb's ears um, uh, are, are great for this, reflecting light. Um, new plants, uh, these variegated uh, liriope, this uh, snow cone, which is a, a real uh, showstopper. Um, you know, if if you want people walking down a uh, a pathway in the evening where maybe your your lighting isn't the best, you know, if you line it with uh, these light colored plants, uh, it really defines where and how you you should be walking. Uh, so it can be very useful that way. A um, little shot in my garden, you can see at night. This is this is all dark all dark. I have kind of light colored steps uh, going down towards my woodland. So that's visible. But then I get these pops of color like this Ajuga incisa bicon and this uh, Hasta 
funds, um, you know, and, and I like that, uh, you know, during the day, it's a great play in color and texture in here um, with some, some, you know, trying to do some echoing, but really it's uh, it, it at night, this pops even more uh, as everything else kind of fades into the background. Pay no attention to the mulberry weed back here. You know, woody plants are great as well. Um, this uh, Abies coriana silberlock, the needles are all curled around the stems. So what you see is the, the uh, kind of waxy blue underside to the, the needles. It's a great dwarf growing um, a conifer. Uh, it's, it's one of the, the most, for conifer enthusiasts around the world, it's one that is um, highly prized and, and um, people really, really love it. But I mean, you can picture that at night, it just, it just shines, shines, shines. Uh, and in a conifer garden, those, those blues and silvers are um, the things that pop and everything else disappears um, in the evenings. Palms as well. Uh, this, uh, the, the Saranoa, um, the blue form, Cinerea, which I find to be hardier than, than the others, um, are are great at lighting up dark areas and they're very uh, uh, pretty shade uh, tolerant so they can help light up a a woodland or or real shady spot during the daytime as well as at night uh, grasses are great i just noticed in our restrooms here we have a great team of um volunteer uh uh floral uh arranging uh volunteers and they cut things out in the garden and there's uh, a beautiful just uh display of um uh, grass uh seed heads in there uh which are that silvery white which really show up um i really like uh, nacella or stipa tenuissima um because not only do you get that that reflection off this um silvery buff uh, seed heads, but they they move in the the breeze, and so you get movement as well as color uh, at night. And the and the blue agaves and and uh, related plants, of course, are also great for reflecting reflecting that that moonlight. Now, I'm not going to get into it. There, there's so many other directions I could go uh, with the night garden, but but some other things just to think about are hardscapes and how they can uh, affect what you see in the evening. Um, you know, if you have a, a pathway that's all very dark, uh, even, you know, unless it is lit, uh, it, it's it's going to be a uh, kind of a tricky proposition to go down it. If you line it with something that's very bright and variegated that does reflect light, that helps a lot. Um, but if you use a lighter color in there, um, people can, you can see it. Now we often kind of gravitate towards here in the Southeast darker colors because those uh, lighter colors reflect the sun so much, but if you, if you mix it up a little bit like this, um, that can kind of give you the best of both worlds, but also, you know, you know, this wall at night, this wall is, is you're getting some light from, from this wall. And then you have the negative space of the espalier plant. Now it's beautiful during the day, even during the winter, uh, with no leaves, it's beautiful when it has leaves on it. But uh, at night, with very little little light going, uh, it really has a dramatic presence. And if you shine a light up onto it, um, even more so, where you really uh, draw up that that um, uh, that texture and that the the fineness of those all those little branches, uh, and and it's it's a beautiful thing. And it brings us to lights. Um, you know, lighting a garden is it really transforms it. Uh, we have our moonlight in the garden uh, event here um, going on in you know the second and third weekends in November at the, at the Arboretum every year, and the number of people, even longtime volunteers who are very very familiar with the garden, longtime members, they get out in the garden 
where it's lit. Uh, and all of a sudden they come back and they say, I almost got lost out in the garden. It looks so different to me at night. The you You're able to highlight things that you might not be highlighted at other times. Um, you're able to draw people to areas that, that maybe don't bring people as much, uh, during the daytime. Um, it adds a, a different sense of depth, um, during the daytime. If you were looking at this view, you know, there's a cycad right here and a wall behind it in this, um, cascading loripedalum. You might not even really notice these plants behind there because this is, you know, you're kind of more here, whereas now you really look through and see this. And this amazing plant, this is a, a Rhodolea, um, beautiful flowering plant. But what you're seeing is the underside of the leaves. Um, and there's no light really shining up there. There's some some light uh, adjacent to it. But you really, um, you get the sense of that silveriness of the leaves. And this, at this time of year, would be kind of just a, a dark green plant that you might not notice or pay much attention to uh, if it wasn't being lit like this. So lights can really um, change how, how a garden looks. And it doesn't take a lot of lights. You, you, you can... Um, you know, up light, down light, um, a few, uh, a few plants and, uh, really make a difference. You know, you can do something like this, which is, uh, a pretty amazing view. Probably the most striking garden I've ever seen is, uh, the ethnobotanic garden in I keep getting it wrong in Oaxaca. I think I told somebody Jalapa today, but Oaxaca, um, which is adjacent to a monastery, kind of in it's a walled garden, but big. And it was owned by a artist and it's planted in these very dramatic uh, shapes, uh, cactus and, and agaves and, and things like that. Uh, but they've lit it at night. And so they both light the plants like you see here from the arboretum, but they also um, do lighting to create shadows on these walls that surround this. So, um, and it may be a plant that's relatively far away, but they, uh, they light it so that you get these really dramatic shadows as well as uh, the dramatic lit plants. And, and it's, it makes for a magical experience. That's my feeling about a, a garden that's lit at night is it's, it's a completely different experience than um, what you see during the day. And it's, it's much more, uh, it engages the senses in a different way. So I am happy to answer questions. Um, here's a video from 2019 in Moonlight in the Garden. Uh, let me see on the okay. chat. Uh, well, so uh, Chris asked, and I'm not too sure if I understand what the question is asking, but they were with regards to Brugmansia, they said, what is it about the fork and the branches before it blooms? Um, I'm not sure exactly uh, what's being asked. It's the, the plants need to grow to a certain height. Um, usually it's, it's really getting into about the four to five feet before they will start flowering. Now they'll shoot up straight stalks and they'll start, um, they'll start branching. And so that may be, uh, you know, it's kind of the, the same thing. They need to get to a certain um, stage each summer in order to, uh, to start uh, flowering. And that may just have been described as it, they have to start branching um, before they'll, they'll um, flower. Okay. Uh, Marilyn was asking, so are the flowers that are fragrant in the evening pollinated by moths? And she was asking because she noticed there were tubular ones that might be good for birds. So, um, yes, uh, those those long tubular ones really are ones that you need a, a, a moth or, you know, butterfly type uh, proboscis for that even more so than birds they're they're long and longer and narrower than uh, many birds oh excuse me hummingbirds oh hummingbirds yes no but no they they tend to be moths um they uh 
but also beetles. beetles. Uh, you know, another one that's I didn't put in here is our our native uh, southern magnolia, which does become more fragrant at night. It's, it's fragrant during the day, but more fragrant at night. And, you know, that's a old, old, um, in a, on the evolutionary time scale, very old plant. And it's pollinated by big old big beetles, beetles coming in there and bumbling around, around and knocking things around. That's not a very elegant system. But yes, these these white flowers and these fragrant um, uh, uh uh, evening fragrant flowers. Yes, that is, that's, it's to attract pollinators. Okay. So you mentioned that lilies were easy to grow and Chris is asking about stargazer lilies specifically. Are they easy to grow? Um, you know, honestly, I've never grown stargazers. I, they're certainly easy to grow in production because that's why they're so ubiquitous. Um, but I would think they're they're they'd be pretty easy to grow and and you know a good moist well drained soil and sun until the rabbits bite them off right before they flower. <laughs> of course, as they always do. Um, Judy's asking. Well, she says she has Mirabilis halapa that she's had uh, she's grown from seed had in the past two years in well drained soil with medium moisture, but they don't get very large and they don't bloom. Um, she knows about uh, root knot nematodes with those, but she hasn't seen any galls on the roots. Do you have any suggestions about what might this be? Gosh, I don't. Um, sunlight would be the only thing. Other thing I'd suggest they need, you know, lots of light. Um, and, and you're right. I'm glad you brought up the root knot nematodes. These are in the same family as as uh tomatoes and and peppers so root knot nematode uh, can be a, a problem there um but generally in my my um experience enough water and uh sunlight and they do great okay um johnny was asking me about uh the ab's silver lock uh, how would that do on the sound side at the outer banks uh, Abies coriana is more of the is, is a more heat tolerant uh, species uh, unless it's grafted on to if it's on Abies coriana or Abies firma as a rootstock. Um, it, it's a pretty heat tolerant um, uh, plant. If it's grafted on uh, Fraser fir. Uh, then, then it'd probably be a quick death uh, there. Uh, I don't know about um, you know salt spray that kind of thing, but it will it will tolerate um, yeah it, it, it'll tolerate well drained soils. But it also because those needles are curled around, uh, it is probably less drought tolerant if that's an issue than some other ones. So kind of. Plant one and tell me. Um. <laughs> okay. Um, Marilyn's asking a question here that I think is interesting. Does night lighting in the garden mess up the plant's biological clock that might affect blooming or growth? It can. Yes. So uh, we we had a plant uh, growing here. Very common plant or was, uh, uh, I, I, I don't know a common name for it, Lespedeza purple uh, fountain big arching um, plant flowers heavily uh usually twice a year um uh, in kind of late spring and then in fall we had one that would not flower would not flower would not flower uh so and it was in kind of a high profile spot we moved it and it uh the, ne the next season it flowered great and what we re and continued to after that and what we realized was it was growing right by a light bollard in the garden that uh, you know comes on on a uh, photo cell. So when it gets dark, it comes on, and when it gets light, it goes off. And the the Lespedeza, its, its flowering is based, based on, on day length. So if it's not getting, if the days aren't getting shorter, it's not gonna um, it's not gonna know to flower. It's not based on temperature and those kinds of things. So it's, it is plant dependent. 
uh, is really the answer to whether the lighting will affect uh, flowering or, or growth. Um, and, and I'll also sure. mention, I just, I, I am seeing a couple of the chats and I'll mention while I talk about that day length and answer to somebody's question about moonlight in the garden, which is why wait until November. It's because we wait until it's because of daylight savings um, time The you can't light the garden very effectively when it's still light outside. So, uh, and I don't know about everybody on, on this call, but I don't want to be here from eight to 11 um, instead of, you know, five thirty to nine thirty uh, because we can't start until so late. So that's that's why November. Uh, uh, question about would night lighting harm some of the pollinators? N no, um, that shouldn't harm pollinators. Now, too much uplighting, you know, could lead, help lead to contribute to light pollution. Um, but generally, when you're talking about uh, lighting in the garden, you're not, these are not, you know, blaring parking lot lights and things like that. These are, um, you know, really just about lighting a tree. And so they're under canopies, they're, they, they just don't contribute as much to the, um, the, the light pollution as, uh, as other things would. Um, so are there solar lights that will work in gardens, especially in partial sun? Uh, almost without fail, solar lights are terrible. Um, they don't last very long. They don't work very well. They're, uh, let me change, they're okay. Um, but with low, uh, you know, low voltage lighting, LED lighting, uh, the, they're pretty easy to run um, uh, long distances without without real problems. Um, so, uh, you know, if you're going way away from the house, yeah, maybe you have to do um, solar lights. Uh, but, um, you know, a trench and some wiring and a, in a piece of conduit out to a central spot out in the garden. And, and now you've got power out there and you can use from that. Um, what's a conifer that will shimmer in the night garden that is way too shady in the day? Um, there are, uh, some, some great, uh, well, if it's not too shady, uh, the shore juniper, juniperus conferta has kind of silvery foliage and that's more shade tolerant than most other um, junipers. Also our native white cedar, there's some really nice, very, very uh, silvery blue um, forms of that, like uh, Camacyparis thyroides um, andaliensis um, that are fairly shade tolerant. Um, but, you know, conifers are not don't love the shade. Uh, one another conifer that would be good would, would be um, a podocarp. Some of the variegated podocarps would would really shimmer in the shade. Okay. Well, that looks like that's all the questions that we have in the chat. So uh, thank you, Mark, so much for doing this chat for us. Uh, I like that. It was good to think about more than just like what flowers are blooming at night. You know, it's like you give us a lot to think about. And I think that's really cool. Really open our minds up about what we can do in the garden at night. Um, thank you, everybody out there who tuned in with us today for this program. Make sure you join us next week at on Wednesday at three o'clock. Mark is going to be doing another talk about boxwoods, which should be great. We've got a nice little boxwood collection here. And I want people to know that there is a lot more to boxwoods than than they think. They're not all little round shrubs in front of colonial houses. There's oh. uh, it's a very diverse uh, group. And um, I think you'll you hopefully you'll learn something. Absolutely. That'll be a great talk. So I hope you all come out for that one next week. We'll see you then. Y'all take care. Bye bye.